pressure looks good. All right now. Yikes. You bet. Incur. We don't need any more of these. What's up, everybody? Welcome to this week's episode up, of NASA everybody? Space Flight Live. Let me get a... F- okay, one second. Let me get a 5x5 five five in chat so you know you can okay, hear us okay. Awesome. All right, I'm getting five by One fives second. from chat. I know we got a little audio issue there. Chris is fixing. Sounds like he got it. Speaking of Chris, this <laughs> week on NASA Spaceflight Live. Hi, I'm Jack Byer. I'm your host Hello. this week, and we've joined by Chris Bergen, NASA Spaceflight Actual, the Indeed. founder of our illustrious site. What's up, Chris? Hello. And also this week, we are joined by Ian. What's up, Ian? How's it going, everyone? It's Ian Atkinson, Ian Pineapple on Twitter. Yes, sir. One and only. And of course, Crispy is NASA Spaceflight on Twitter. You know, the the one with all of the retweets that has all of the news. Cool. So don't forget, everybody, this is a interactive show that we do weekly. So if you have any questions, at NASA Spaceflight in chat, and it will pop up in some nifty software that Michael wrote. Speaking of Michael, he's in the back pushing buttons and pulling levers. Uh, thank you for doing that, Michael. And yeah, ask your questions. We will discuss them. Try to keep the question relevant to the topic that we're discussing at the time. You know, if we're talking about, oh, I don't know, Neutron from Rocket Lab for some reason, then maybe keep your question related to that and you'll have a higher likelihood of getting it answered. And when we're talking about Starship, that's a good time to ask your Starship questions. But really, if you can't hold it in, just let it fly. (laughs) All right. I think we should get right into it, yeah? Yeah, let's do it. Cool. So Rocket Lab has updated the design of Neutron. They had a big announcement this week with a slick video. Peter Beck took us through some of the different design decisions. Who wants to to take that? I think I'll start quickly by saying it's um, the the update we've been waiting for for a long time now, because when he first announced it with his eating hat video, we thought, okay, they're way into development and we'll get an update pretty soon. And it's been a while, relatively speaking until he provide this big update and the update is interesting it's a great looking vehicle it's reusable his overview video is quite a few digs at spacex we say um but i think that's just his competitive nature it's friendly competition it's almost like we've taken the best parts of what they do and try to implement it into our kind of launcher and they're looking at the mega constellation satellite launches so this is that kind of like workhorse vehicle a reusable booster vehicle where the second stage is not reusable, but it's what's going to be something that makes it economically viable. I'm fascinated by how it goes and how fast they can develop it because Rocket Lab are a very good esteemed company now. They're very much established since their first days of I never want to hold a game, which was almost, which became a t-shirt in fact, I should say. It was something that I, I think that they have not got their feet on the ground and they can really produce this vehicle. And I want to see how well it does in development. It's going to be exciting to see them get it, uh, get it put together. I mean, I feel like rocket lab for a long time had a really significant lead sort of in the small sat market. Mm-hmm. And it's, it'll be interesting to see how that, how the dynamics of the entire market with all the different small sat launchers plays out, especially as, I mean, it, I don't know if I would call it a setback, but Neutron has been sort of shuffled around, right? There's new different things about it. So, uh, you know, it, it's going to take them some time to get it fully functioning, but it will. And there's a there's a picture you can see of it there. It's it's a really slick and cool looking rocket, if I if I yeah. may say so myself. Yeah, it's that looks really cool. And the weird thing about it is we're used to rockets like Falcon 9 or Electron being like long, thin, you know, like look like spaghetti noodles. But this one here is kind of different. This one's t- This one's short, but it's fat. It's a seven meter diameter at the widest, and it's only about 40 meters tall, which isn't even as tall as the Falcon 9 first stage, yet it is pretty close to a Falcon 9 class in terms of its payload capability. Um, not only that, it is mostly reusable, about as reusable as Falcon 9. It's kind of difficult to say a percentage reusability here, but this it looks to be a promising vehicle, I think, and for 
the medium lift launch vehicle for the medium lift category and as well as doing multiple small payloads like constellations yep. this seems to be a very promising option should it come to fruition in the way we're seeing it now if it comes online in the mid 2020s i think it could be a very promising option so it's like you said it's mostly reusable this the second stage is uh is expendable they're going to try and make that really low cost and uh, and really simple to build so that they can make that economically make sense um seven engines methalox powered i think there was a previous iteration of neutron was that rp1 and uh and kerosene or was that methalox as well the first when they did the reveal there was a not a lot of details they gave a basic render they said we don't know what engines we're doing we don't know what the second stage will look like we're not sure how we're gonna make it reusable we don't know what material we're gonna make out of so that's pretty much a teaser but now we're looking at the more detailed design so now we actually know what the engines will be using got it that makes sense and yeah, there's a word about the fairy, by the way. The fairy is fantastic. It looks yes. like something yeah. out of James Bond movie. It's... We should have queued up uh, a, a clip from James Bond. What even <laughs> is that Moonraker that that's from? Or... No, it's um, oh, chat, help us out. Which you which only Bond live movie? twice. It's not Moonraker. That's the one with the shuttles. I think Ian might be right. <laughs> no, that's you only live twice. I think my father's a Bond fan, so I think he said that. There we nice. go. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, the landing legs are fixed, which is interesting. And, you know, it's not like Falcon 9 where they have to deploy the legs and then retract them. They're kind of just like these little stubs at the bottom of the vehicle. Yeah, uh, yeah. And yeah, that, that they're sticking with carbon fiber, which is also interesting. A lot of other companies seem to be on the stainless steel train. I mean, I'm thinking Astra, uh, uh, Blue Origin, SpaceX, st stainless steel. It's, it's popular, but Rocket Lab's sticking with carbon. It's interesting given that, uh, I don't know. It has to survive the heat of re-entry. That's what they're sticking with carbon. Yeah. Can we give I a mean... shout out to Places Play, by the way, because he actually did a super chat earlier before I even asked, saying it's Peter Beck's Rocky Lab, uh, a James Bond villain. Yeah, see I you see only you twice. only live twice. Yeah. yeah. So thank you for the super chat and well done for being preemptive there with the answer. <laughs> Smart. Doing doing our job for us there. What were you gonna say, Ian? Um I oh yeah, what I was gonna say is it's not really surprising for me or to me to see them using carbon fiber with electron because electrons made pretty much entirely of carbon fiber they've began to master producing rockets with carbon fiber they have an automated machine uh rosy i think they call it um where they basically take sheets of carbon fiber and they're able to like stitch it together cut the holes that they need and in like 12 hours you have a complete rocket tank within 12 hours and I think using that plus there's inevitably going to be some improvements between now and 2024 that they can then put into a neutron. So I think that this could be very viable. And for them as a company compared to say than SpaceX, I think carbon fiber makes more sense for a future rocket because they already know how to use it. Whereas with SpaceX, they kind of had to learn how to use it. They're not that optimized with it. So I think carbon fiber with neutron makes a lot of sense here. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, new technologies these days, like automated fiber layup. It's like it's almost like 3D printing, but with uh, but with carbon fiber instead of like a single a single filament or something. When you have a robot laying it, you don't have to have a bunch of people doing all the layup. I am I would never want to work in doing any kind of carbon fiber layup. No thanks. It sounds really complicated and like ultra hard painting times five. I don't know. Really scientific terms here. I know. Um, I, I found a part of the video quite interesting where he showed the difference between stainless steel and aluminum and then the carbon composite, which they're going to make, because Elon has always said that carbon composite is extremely expensive, especially compared to steel. Yep. And he made the point of saying, well, we're going to make it ourselves. So he's found a way around that, possibly. But of course, his vehicles are much smaller than the Starships and Super Heavy Boosters that stainless steel Elon wants to make. So you can see the compromise between the two there. Yeah. And I think even Peter Beck, going continuing our carbon fiber chat, Peter Beck said, I think this might have been a few years ago, that Rocket Lab employed at the time one third of all of New Zealand's carbon composite trained people. I'm not sure what the specific term is that for that, but like their entire carbon composite industry of New Zealand, Rocket Lab employed a third of it. Let's see, I'm just pulling some questions out of here. Let's see, here's one. Um, is Rocket Lab still going to human rate Neutron? How will the integrated fairings impact human rating on the rocket? That's a so good I'll say question. That first, but <laughs> both of us were thinking at the same time. Yeah. 
Are they are they still planning on human rating, or are they? Well, I, I forget if they planned on it in the first place. I remember there was some talk of it, which is why the whole eating the hat thing happened, right? Yeah. Did Peter he Beck actually did. mention they were going to do human rating in his latest video? I don't think he did. Yes, he did. And I recall when a certain Peter Beck was on a certain NSF live show, where he said, and it struck with me when he said it because it was quite a very valid thing to say that he didn't want to be the person knocking on the relative's door of astronauts that had died on his rocket. That was you. I mean, I that's obvious, but I'd never really heard it being said in that terms, and that's why you can see why how nervous Elon was for DM2. The guy was a nervous wreck for it, and I don't blame him because I think everyone was. Yep. Because when you're launching payloads, that's one thing. When you're launching humans, that's quite another. So I can understand why Peter Beck was very nervous about maybe making it crew rated. But he's not mentioned it in his latest update, so maybe that's a back burner thing. And that would make sense because you want to launch a vehicle like Starship will lots and lots and lots of times before you put humans on board, just like with Falcon 9. So that makes sense to me. Yeah, that's very fair. And I'm wondering if with this whole so he did he's talked in the past about human rating. I'm wondering, is Rocket Lab going to be the one to build a capsule? Or are they saying we'll make it human rated if someone wants to make a capsule for it? I'm wondering if that's what they mean by that, or if they're like, we're making it human rated and eventually we'll make a capsule for it. But that would be neat to see what they do with that. Yeah, I mean, I think I can speak for all of us in you know the business, if you want to call it that, of covering space flight. Is, it's all, like you said, Chris, it's all fun and games when we're launching another 60 Starlink satellites or whatever commsat. But what, as soon as you get into, you know, human lives are on the line, like, I don't want to take a photograph of somebody dying. Like imagine if I took a photograph of Challenger or something like that would be, yeah. I would not be a photograph I would be have happy to have taken or an event I would be happy to have witnessed. And I can't even imagine what the stress is like on the folks that do do human space flight and are responsible for it. I mean, I'm just a, a jerk with a camera, right? Like they're the ones who are actually, they're responsible for human lives. Can I just say that we're 30 minutes into the show and I'm going to do a shuttle digression here, but it's actually a very valid point rather than a fun point during a challenger accident the media photographers that are taking pictures of the explosion they all decided not to publish most of the pictures they literally gave the wire services like two of the most iconic ones which was the with the actual fireball the rest all went to the rogers commission so they didn't publish them the photographers kept them and gave them to the rogers commission for the investigation and I thought that was just a beautiful thing because that just showed how invested they were, that they were not going to make a quick book out of their pictures because some of the pictures in the Rogers Commission were horrendous and also something you'd imagine the mass media would love to publish, but they gave them all to the commission instead. So that was just a wonderful thing of a, a photographer thinking, this is bad, I'm not going to make money out of this. Yeah, that's... You know, sometimes uh, there's a little bit of nobility, which is which is nice mm -hmm. in the space flight. Here's a question from Georgie Clark, and then we'll move on from Rocket Lab after maybe another one after this. Let's see. Could Neutron's hungry hippo fairing, or he says hungry hippo. It's like I'm picturing <laughs> yeah. a, a hippo with the localization <laughs> of hungry. Uh, so it's, it's in Budapest. Um, fairing capture, it, okay, sorry, let me start over. Could Neutron's hungry hippo fairing capture dead satellites or debris after releasing main payloads? I mean, I'm sure anything... It's, Sounds plausible, right? Mm -hmm. It's not anything they've really talked about, but it's certainly, with the whole uh, James Bond thing, it certainly lends itself to speculation that, hey, this thing could pick up a, a dead satellite in the same way that the shuttle could. Can I can I just say, actually, the funny thing is Rocket Lab sent a release with the actual high-res renders, and the renders were named Hungry Hippo.jpg. So they're naming it Hungry Hippo. That's so amazing. It was almost like a, a kind of like they knew what they were doing with that kind of like the way it'd be seen by the public and the media. But that's a good question. I think it could. But would that be a viable use of the rocket? I yeah. don't know. That's the question, isn't it? It's all about viability. Yeah, and in my head, the first stage is more of like, you know, think about Falcon 9's first stage. It doesn't go up into orbit and stay in orbit and then do work and then come back and land. That's the job of the second stage. First stage really just throws the second stage at, at the appropriate velocity, and then first stage comes home. So I imagine... I'm not a rocket scientist, but I imagine the first stage of of neutron will be sort of similar, where it, it gets high and fast enough up to get the second stage to where it needs to be um, to do its job, but it doesn't actually hang around in orbit and do James Bond stuff, as cool as that would be. Yeah. 
Um, and let's see. Here's a question from Ed, sort of like a meta question. What do you think Rocket Lab's motivation was for the video? Recruiting, attracting investors, other? I mean, to me, it's it's just standard, uh, you know, here's an update on our rocket. It's kind of like mm -hmm. a nice, cheeky, like, poke and fun at SpaceX. Not in a mean way, but in like a well, sort of like a friendly rival, like competition sort of way. I'm sure... Uh, I mean, I suspect Elon would appreciate that sort of like, hey, we're doing this, you guys are doing that kind of thing. Um, I mean, what do you guys think the motivation behind uh, this video was? I mean, it's at the very least a good explainer. Yeah, yeah. I, I, per I personally, sorry, <laughs> I, I personally think it's because they've got a great PR team. There's Morgan Bailey and there's a team behind her as well now at Rocket Lab who have been on the ball since day one. Ever since that first T-shirt, I never want to hold again. They're just they're clued into what the public and their followers are interested in, and they've kind of like run with it. And I think Peter Beck's on board with that as well, because he likes he likes that kind of like portrayal of his company. It's his company, remember? So I think there's a mainly about the way their PR representation representation is, but also they are about money and investment. So it makes sense. Let's promote what we're going to do and bring in more money. So it's probably both. Yeah, I agree. Because like, yeah, like you said, they're a public company, they need to raise funds. This is not going to be, it's not going to cost like a million dollars. to This is going to be a lot of money to develop this rocket, especially with all the ambitions they plan for it, the full reusability, the opening fairing, all, or not, sorry, not full reusability, mostly re reusability, but the new engines dealing with new propellants they've never dealt with before. It's going to be a fully cryogenic rocket. It's not just going to have kerosene in it. It's going to be liquid methane, liquid oxygen, much larger engines, which they're not 3D printing now with a brand new cycle. This is going to be an expensive project. So they do need money. So that I could definitely see that video being, hey, we need money for this. This is going to be cool. And we already have these plans for it. But also at the same time, just to generate space community hype to be, hey, look at this new rocket. Mix of both, I think. Makes sense. All right. Is there anything in the uh, in the old panel there that tickles your fancy on uh, on Rocket Lab, Ian, that you feel like answering before we move on? I see the the first question in the queue. Um, uh, sorry, I'm pronouncing your game. Iker Gamer is asking, what's the difference between the openable and detachable fairing, and which is more reliable? Now, that is a tricky question to answer because, first off, there's never been really a opening and closing fairing, un unless you're talking about the shuttle payload bay, in which case that was very reliable. Um, but we've never seen they don't even, they probably don't even have prototypes of this fairing yet they do have one fairing half from the original design but they might have very basic test hardware at the moment so we don't know any numbers about the reliability here we'll have to see what the flight testing provides i mean it's an interesting question given that like falcon 9's fairing you can i'm sure test it on the ground to a certain extent but once it's in space it's going to be used and then uh you know it's it's I don't know. For some reason, that strikes me as trickier than a piece of hardware that's attached to the rocket that stays attached to the rocket. But who knows? The the added complexity of the four clamshell th doors, like it's, I'm sure there's different trades for for both uh, for both options there. One yeah, thing they that's... can do, Jack, is they could take it to NASA Glenn because that's where SpaceX took their fellow fairings to uh, Plumbrook Station. It's called. It's like a vacuum where they can test the fairing separation. They don't get all the data, especially they don't get back the return to being. What was previously caught by Miss Miss Chief and Miss um what was the other one? Miss Chief Gavel Miss Tree. Miss Tree. <laughs> Gav's not listening. Uh, Gavin's gonna be mad. <laughs> yeah, and now they just recover from the sea because the payloads are coming back quite softly. They can just scoot them up from the sea. So that's uh, Bob and Doug, which then uh, retrieved them. So I think they can do some element of testing in like a vacuum environment. But yeah, you're right. The rest of it is just real world testing. Yeah, yeah. You can't simulate weightlessness weightlessness nope. on Earth. Ooh, yeah, look at that. That's a picture of the fairing being tested there at Plumbrook. Yeah. That's a big fairing, too. Oh, massive. That's the thing that catches a lot of people out, how big fairings are. But when mm -hmm. you start seeing my dog side, Pauline took some photos from the part of LA, was it? Yep. Where one of the fairings was on the side, and there's people around it, and the people are tiny, and you're thinking, that's the payload? That's only half payload? Yep. It's amazing, the fairing, yeah. Yeah, kind of yeah, one it... of the cool things about the, the Starman launch, um, the Falcon Heavy demo launch, is that putting a Tesla inside the fairing and seeing how much room there still was kind of gives you a, a really good sense of scale versus a sort of a featureless cube of a satellite or something like that. Yeah. yeah. And rockets in general, like you don't understand the scale till you're standing right next to one. Like when I didn't, I knew how big a Falcon 9 booster was. I knew it was huge. I knew they need to transport it by truck. But until I stood next to one, I never really appreciated this thing is massive. 
like you you can't even fit this into like a gym like this is crazy yeah it, it, it's it's unreal yeah uh here's a question from sorry i'm, I'm mispronouncing your name jaron jaron wasnik or wasnik do you guys think neutron will launch from the cape eventually do you have any rumblings to that effect Ooh. or you think they'll probably I, be happy I, at wallops yeah i mean the thing is rocket lab did look at what was called 39c which is not the old 39c which is going to be like another 39a and 39b next door this was 39c inside 39b so basically sls because it launches so many times <laughs> once every two years they wanted to find a way of finding more more um, rockets to launch from 39b so they created a small start launch pad inside 39b called 39c but no one bit no one took it rocket lab were looking at it and they said no we're not interested we're going to go to wallops instead so would they then now because that was for electron launches would they now consider staying with wallops and building the pad will they consider going back to 39c and saying okay now we've got a viable rocket for ksc let's go from there one to watch it's a very interesting question yeah i mean and, uh, i imagine they might be able to do a dual use a dual use pad at wallops sort of like how ula has mm -hmm. the dual use atlas and centaur pad uh down there that's at the cape right or is it at yeah. kennedy oh god um i think it's at the cape it, but yeah it remains to be seen how that'll play out sorry ian i interrupted you oh no you're fine i was going to say like about more talking about wallops so they built a dedicated electron pad out there neutron's way too big but they did propose I think when they first talked about Neutron, they said the main launch site would be pad 0A at Wallops, which is where Antares launches from right now. And the thing is, Antares is kind of expected to stop flying middle of this decade. Um, but also at the same time, that could be, they could make it a dual use pad, like you said. But also they already have a lot of investment put into Wallops. They're going through certification to fly their flight termination system at Wallops. Yeah. They've already built an assembly and integration hangar uh, about like a few miles away from the pad. I've driven by it, the thing's huge but they integrate electrons there. So they already have a foothold in wallops. They don't have anything in the Cape to our knowledge. So they already have their processing facilities. They have office buildings. They just need to build some larger infrastructure for Neutron. So I think wallops, at least for an initial launch campaign, might be their first choice. Yep, that makes sense. And just speaking as a sort of a, I mean, mostly nobody, but someone who has been to various launch sites around the country, except for wallops, that's on the list. Um, I can say that Vandenberg, for example, is way more chill, for lack of a more scientific term, than Kennedy Space Center. Uh, at Kennedy Space Center, sort of as the flagship launch site, I have to imagine uh, you, there's going to be more hoops and stuff that you have to jump through, and that comes with, you know, a certain amount of cost or downside or just time that things take versus they're already at wallops they're already established there like you said they're testing their flight termination system there i met i can't help but imagine based on my experience that wallops is more chill sorry for being so imprecise but yeah. then than kennedy space center so um yeah that's just a, a thought i had while, while you were mentioning that cool yeah and Let's... that's one of the reasons they chose wallops just because uh it's there's not much going on there's two launches a year pretty much yeah, so there's plenty of uh, of range time to to for them to soak up. Yep. Um, a couple more on Rocket Lab. Let's see. Oliver is asking, do you know if they're going to use the Archimedes engine on the upper stage, SpaceX style, or uh, he said they watched the presentation, but Peter Beck didn't say anything about it. Do we know uh, what their what the upper stage engine plan is, or is it kind of still unknown? Yeah, um, there were a few questions asked. I think Scott Manley actually asked the questions on Twitter. Um, someone related to Peter Beck and Peter did say it is an Archimedes engine on the second stage. They didn't talk it through yet because they're not sure exactly how they're going to apply it to the second stage, but that it would be Archimedes or Archimedes derived. Excellent. Cool deal. Don't you love when CEOs are active on Twitter? That's yeah. cool. And also the people on Twitter ask good questions. <laughs> um, <laughs> let's see. What is a different, uh, we already did that one. And here's one, John is asking, what seems more efficient for landing? Falcon 9 grid fins or Neutron's little winglets? We know they, they reuse the grid fins, right? Like every now and then we yeah. see them get mil like melty almost on re-entry, but I think that's just like an ablative coating um, being yes, burned is, away. Yeah. I don't think they actually like burn through the, fair, the grid fins or anything. No, because they're really expensive for a start of titanium. Yep, yep. So they cost a ton of money. So they want to get them back and reuse them. But um, I, I don't know. I've got no clue on the advantages and disadvantages of either system. What do you think, Ian? 
Yeah, I mean, we so we saw before with the Falcon 9, the aluminum fairings, they could serve, I mean, sorry, the aluminum grid fins, they could survive two flights, but they'd need refurbishment. Now the titanium grid fins, titanium has a higher melting point, it's stronger, it can survive much longer. Um, that rhymed. <laughs> that sounds like song lyrics. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> no rapping on the, anyway. Um, but yeah, the grid fins, the titanium fins have been proven to be reliable. So much so that they don't like getting rid of them. They really don't like getting rid of them. They're expensive, they're reliable, but we've never seen anything other than grid fins being used for flight. New Glenn and Neutron will use little flappy fins to control themselves, but neither of those have flown. Neither of those are close to flying. All we have to go off now is the grid fins. And if two companies are going for it, it seems like they might be a viable option, but again, we haven't seen them fly yet. I mean, as long as you're able to provide the necessary control authority, who cares what form that 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 aero surface takes the shape of? As long as it gets the job done. Um, I, yeah, but yeah, not. I am not prepared to speculate on efficiency of one versus the other. I think that's pretty good for Rocket Lab. I might have missed a couple questions. I apologize, but yeah, let's move on to the next thing. How about? Yeah, let's do that. It'll be very cool to see Neutron come together, and I definitely look forward to it. I mean, we all like new yeah. rockets and test campaigns, don't we? Oh, yeah. I love uh, me. Let's, <laughs> Let's see. NASA to secure three additional Crew Dragon flights from SpaceX. What do you guys think about this? This is a, uh, I mean, dare I say, is this a coup? Is SpaceX, is this, is this just a <laughs> SpaceX steamroller moving on and, and continually crushing Boeing? What do you, what's your read? If I can start with the obvious, <laughs> Starliner has not yet launched a crew. It's not yet achieved the goals of the test flight. So they are way behind and they cost more money. But you've got to be careful when we say they cost more money. It's because SpaceX technically got some money with a cargo version of their Dragon. So it does kind of balance out. But let's face it, it's still obvious that SpaceX crew Dragon is way ahead, way ahead of Starliner. By some way, I think they're looking at some like Crew Six, isn't it? Before Starliner One, now. Yeah, Michael yeah. Baylor, some guy on the internet, tweeted that, given this announcement, basically SpaceX's original commercial crew contract will be complete, or it will have the final one mission of that contract will have launched by the time Boeing flies its first operational mission, which is just like. I mean, Boeing, what are you doing, guys? How far know, have you yeah. fallen? It's it's mm -hmm. like imagine. Uh, if Apple had just completely dropped the ball and we like nobody bought their phones and their phones were awful and exploded and you know cost way mm -hmm. more than the competitor like it's just uh, poor comparison I'm sure but holy cow what it, what an amazing uh, what an amazing stumble for such a legendary company I mean I mean let's let's face it you know it, it's an amazing coup for SpaceX against a company they had suing uh, issues with in the early days, ironically. So there's a kind of like, I'm sure it's basically loving it. I'm sure Boeing are motivated to sort it out. I just keep thinking back to the crew, commercial crew down select, where Dream Chaser was pushed out of the competition yep. because it was at one test flight where one landing gear did not deploy and it wasn't even Dream Chaser's landing gear. It was borrowed from an Air Force fighter. Yep. just for the test flight. Yep. So it wasn't a vehicle issue. And I wish we'd seen Dream Chaser given a chance because I've got a funny feeling Dream Chaser would have been launching crew by now compared to that Starliner. One, that one really hurts me a lot because it, you might be surprised, audience, uh, the amount of times a, a piece of test aircraft hardware has just like, eh, whatever, it's an F-16 nose gear. Like, it's just sort of a hodgepodge, like Frankenplane. That happens a lot. Yeah. Um, uh, and what was I going to say? Oh, yeah. The fact that Dream Chaser got sort of, you know, so blocked up because of that one little landing test. I'm going to I'm going to do a deep cut here, but it reminds me of uh, of DCX the, or DC 10, the, the DC yeah. Clipper thing where it was it was an early vertical landing, vertical takeoff test bed. And, you know, one of the little legs didn't deploy on one test and it fell over and exploded and the program was canceled. It's like, ah, oh, what could have been? What could have yep. been? Anyways, I, I'll stop. Um, <laughs> Let's see, Crew Dragon is, again, uh, they're getting Crew 7, Crew 8, and Crew 9. Those are the, the new missions. And now I'm, I'm running ahead of Michael. Sorry, there's Dream Chaser in all its glory. I mean, come on, Lifting Body Gang. It's the cool, look look how cool right. it is. It's uh, a baby so, shuttle. Right? So at least Dream Chaser will live on as a, as a it's going to be a cargo vehicle, right? So at least we still get that. But Crew Dream Chaser, uh, maybe someday, maybe someday. 
Um, yeah, it, one of the ahead. great things about sorry, yeah, about Dream Chaser is it's now being used for cargo because it's it's just such a great capability because it's not like shuttle where sorry, Chris, I'm going to take a five second dig at the shuttle. All right, the shuttle had to land at specialized very long runways mm -hmm. like three mile long runways otherwise it, it couldn't stop in time because it's going so fast dream chaser because it's lighter it comes in it can land at pretty much any like major airport runway um now again you really i don't i don't see why you'd want to land a crude dream chaser at lax i don't know what benefit that would give you but again it's just showing that it's it's a very uh, it's a very malleable it's a very useful option that it's not just you can't just land at kennedy space center and vandenberg you can land a lot of places you could do kind of direct cargo delivery to a certain point yeah that'd be really cool um let's see we have some more questions on crew crew i almost said crew dream chaser on crew dragon <laughs> I mean, we could talk about dream chaser too uh let's see robbie rob asking why do they only award six and now three flights they had 20 flights in the first phase of the crs contract so why they don't why don't they award a similarly high number of crude flights this is what i have no idea on you guys are going to have to take it and run no, with it. i don't know the actual answer to that because i'm sure that's in a requirement situation which we'll never get to find out about because they don't they don't reveal that information i've got a funny feeling and a horrible feeling it's related to the iss where they don't know the longevity of the station and they want to find out via continued evaluations how long the space is going to survive also with the russian support because they keep making noises about you know pulling out doing their own space station or what have you so i think it might be related to that where they're going to just keep going to where they know they'll need the crew flights and then extend it as they go with the iss being extended as it goes as well I, yeah, I agree. I was thinking the same thing because when the commercial cargo program came out, they needed something to replace shuttle and they knew the space station could last a little bit longer. They had extended it since Constellation canceled into like the early 2020. So like, okay, we can give a big block to get us to about 2020 or so. Then from there, we can add more. I think it's a similar situation here where, okay, we know the ISS will last a few extra years, but we want to play it safe and not award until 2030 because God forbid something happens and we need to abandon the station or whatever but yeah. I, I think it's just playing it safe and also just seeing because the thing is like these crew is a bit more serious than carrying cargo and if something were to happen with dragon that could i, I don't know where spacex just abandons the project again this is just very hypothetical you don't want to allocate everything to one company at yep. once and then it just just lose it all at once so they're probably awarding it in sections just to play it safe play it by ear and can I just say that's a big thing for SpaceX as well, remember, because the whole idea of selecting two companies to do this was that redundancy in case they'd lost a dragon at some point where they'd have to stand down and find a way of mitigating whatever went wrong with it. And then Starliner would pick up the slack. Right now, if that happens, it's Soyuz. They're back to the old Soyuz situation of relying on those seats to get their astronauts into the ISS to keep a permanent presence. So, it's an incredible situation, but also, again, a positive one because SpaceX have proven they can be reliable. And even to the point of allowing a private mission, Inspiration 4, who would have thought of that within four flights? What is it? What a crew, crew Dragon? Amazing achievement, really is. It can't be underplayed. Yeah, it's pretty astounding, honestly, the fact that, you know, that they've been able to just dominate with Crew Dragon. The Crew Dragon has done so well, you know, knock on wood or IKEA wood or whatever IKEA pressed board. Uh, <laughs> so it, yeah it's 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 really wild and i'm i'm thankful for spacex because like you said if 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 there was no crew dragon or if crew dragon wasn't doing as well as it is it's back to soyuz which nobody i don't think any of us want um a couple super chats came in real quick i'm i'm late to one from rough riders about neutron uh they he's asking about landing neutron on the drone ship i believe neutron will be doing uh uh return to launch site landing Let's see. I'm trying to make sure I'm reading this question right. It's true, yeah. Peter yep. Beck made a, a point to say we don't return to a drone ship. Thank you for how, the support there, Rough Riders. 2021 is that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Brandon Lair, thanks for the support. They say Loch, Loch Ness Monster said give, give NSF tree fitty. Normally the Loch Ness Monster is taking the tree fitty. That's interesting. Thank you, Loch Ness Monster. Uh, and then if you guys don't know what I'm talking about, watch South Park. Jacob Reddle says, could NASA use Dream, Dream Chaser uh, and Crew Dragon to get crew to Gateway Station? Uh, imagine a Dream Chaser orbiting the moon. 
And could they launch F9 or on F9 or FH? I think uh, Dream Chaser was launch vehicle agnostic, right? Yes, it is. It could launch on HTV, Ariane 5, which would be now Vulcan, because it's the same kind of vehicle, and Atlas 5, and that will be now Vulcan, because obviously that's where they've compressed through. They've gone from Atlas 5 to Vulcan as their standard launch vehicle, but it can. I've seen the renders from SNC, where they were, like now Sierra Space, as they call themselves, where they've got a Dream Chaser on top of a HTV and on top of an Ariane 5. So, <laughs> yep. that's great. I mean, I love that. It's, it's vehicle agnostic, so it's, it gives it more redundancy in case of a launch vehicle failure where the launch vehicle stands down for x amount of months yep thank you for the support everybody with the super chats we super appreciate it <laughs> mm. see what i did there um <laughs> i'm sorry uh let's see some crew dragon and whatnot questions Wright is asking how much leeway does nasa have to abandon boeing i mean i think we kind of already covered this right mm. like they wouldn't want to abandon boeing even though boeing's not necessarily doing great because you want to have that diversity of capability in case something happens with one vehicle and not with the other yeah 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 that's that's the whole point of having two providers so you, the original plan was to do say a spacex mission then a boeing mission then a spacex mission then a boeing mission doing one to the other handing off but now it seems like it's going to be a string of spacex missions then probably a string of boeing missions unless nasa wants to give spacex even more missions to kind of interweave them together like the original plan it does sort of beg the question how that will play out and if they do indeed do a string of starliner missions uh what does SpaceX do in the interim? Do they just launch a bunch of private missions? Are they like building up a queue of private missions to with which to fill that that void with? Or I mean, if I was NASA, to me, I would want to keep SpaceX in a readiness posture and actually do the one and one and one and one. Even though Boeing had a ways to catch up, I would kind of want to keep them into a uh, into a you know not let them sort of rest, but maybe. Well Maybe rest is good in some cases. They've Go got ahead, Axiom up in there, Jack. So they, they've got the Axiom missions, which they'll be launching Crew Dragons with. So that'll keep them busy. Good. Yep. Excellent. And I could see NASA being like, all right, hey, we're going to give you some downtime, but we want you to have a Crew Dragon ready within X amount of months um, that you can switch around your manifest if there's an issue with Boeing and we need to get crew up. But again, it, we'll have to see how they play it out. Makes sense. Remy Turk, thank you for the support. They say, keep up the great work. And. James, thank you for the support. They say, is there any talk of retiring Soyuz in the future? Or will Soyuz be flying 200 years from now? I mean, I don't know. <laughs> Soyuz is a heck of a workhorse, right? They're, they're going to a new crew vehicle at some point. Uh, they originally called it Federation. That was the name of it. They keep changing the names more than Elon changes Starship names. So it's, it's something where I think they're planning to try and create a new version of a crew vehicle. They'll probably launch an Angara. And that's why they're building a launch site for it, the launch pad, I should say, which is a massive structure. Uh, so I don't think Soyuz will go forever. It, it's a good question because it feels like it's been going forever, and it has. But there we go, and there's the vehicle in question. So that's the vehicle they're going to go to. And that will then allow them to think more beyond Earth orbit because right now Soyuz is very much, you know, an ISS ferry vehicle. It's, it's the same design as Progress as cargo vehicles. It works. Who can argue with it? It's old technology, but it's been updated internally you know curse keeps letting them letting them down during docking but it's it's a vehicle that's reliable you can't knock it because it brings people back down safely so yeah it will be going forever cool um let's see newt asking are we aware of chris b's camera glitches we are sorry about the chris b's camera glitches he is coming to you from an alternate dimension and this will yeah, be fixed sorry. next time he's on no worries chris it happens it's from the stargate uh <laughs> Let's see, Jorg is asking, uh, or saying, there were mentions of Crew Dream Chaser in the Orbital Reef announcement, which we will get to here in a moment. Um, but good point. Let's see, Newt is asking, wasn't the issue with Dream Chaser the crew hatch being next to the prop lines? I don't know, and you're, you're way more versed on Dream Chaser, either of you, than I am. Was that a, was that a thing? Ring any bells? I, uh, I don't know. No, I mean, the, the thing with Dream Chaser, there's two variants. The crew version of Dream Chaser is quite different from the cargo version of Dream Chaser. It looks like an orca now. It's got TPS changes, it's got design changes, the wings are different. So it's now because it's going to be launched inside the fairing of a rocket rather than just launched on top of an Atlas V like it originally was with Dream Chaser crew version. So they keep changing it. But we've got a lot of documentation on the crew vehicle, but not a lot on the cargo vehicle. And that's what we're going to be looking to focus on in the upcoming years, <laughs> pending when Vulcan gets some engines. From Jeff. Makes sense. <laughs> yep. 
Where's the engines, Jeff? Where are they? Where are they, Jeff? <laughs> Where are they? Okay. Uh, let's see. Moving right along. NASA has signed agreements with three companies. I almost did a bad thing. Uh, with three companies uh, to develop commercial space stations. And those companies are Blue Origin, who's getting $130 million, NanoRacks, who is getting $160 million, which makes my heart sing, and Northrop Grumman, getting $125.6 million interesting very oddly specific number there but three different companies getting paid to develop commercial space stations and my heart weeps for bigelow yeah <sighs> yeah but i digress what do you guys think about this announcement as we watch dream chaser gliding towards the wrong let's just keep watching that michael because like we said there was an amount there was a, a mention of it in, in relation well, to you guys uh, in relation Love to it. In re yeah. <laughs> nice uh you gotta love companies with a sense of humor oh this is the bad one Oh no! Yeah, the left landing is... gear's not out. Michael's just taunting us now. But yeah, yeah this is. The cut, we, I've I've seen the full video. It's quite a tumble. Uh, there that... we go. They've cut that one out the bottom yeah. of the video. Just show it. Yeah. I think I that video <laughs> might be on L two. Maybe. <laughs> Anyways. Not all of them. Anyways. <laughs> anyway. no, the, yeah, the, the thing with um, orbital reef uh, is fascinating because. We can do a segue there between SNC, which now Sierra Space, Bigelow, and the modules because Sierra Space bought some of the rights to Bigelow's designs and hardware. So what we're seeing is kind of like a continuation not of what Bigelow envisioned and yeah. built as prototypes into Sierra Space's ideas for Orbital Reef. So we get to see some Bigelow eventually, after all. But I just wish Robert Bigelow would would say something because. Technically, they're dead. Technically, they're not go coming back to life. Yep. But it's never been really officially announced, is it? I don't believe so. I mean, maybe it's the sort of thing where, um, I don't know if you guys remember Straddle Launch. They went through a big reorganization after Paul Allen died. And there was sort of a whole long period after their first flight where they were sort of trying to find a buyer, figuring out what the future was. Maybe the reason we haven't heard a this you know distinct announcement like that from robert bigelow is because maybe they're trying to figure out a future for for the company but that's 100 percent speculation on my part but mm. neither neither of these uh companies that we're talking about are bigelow specific right just the one that would have sort of heritage would be the blue origin um the, the design that blue origin is going to be studying right and i think is that the one that we're looking at here i'm not sure which of these renders is which companies render yeah, that's kind of a funny thing about how they've designed this. It's like a hodgepodge of companies, isn't it? Okay, so this one is a, an orbital reef render. Thank you, Michael. Um, but yeah, so I mean, I like the idea of more destinations in space. I mean, as much as I would have loved to fly on Inspiration 4, it's kind of like, okay, we're up here. When do we get to the fireworks factory? I mean, let's go uh, if you're, for your Simpsons fans out there. Yeah. But, uh, you know, instead of just sort of or bring the earth in a closet, like let's actually go to a place where we can hang out. Um, I'm all yeah. for this. What, what do you guys think? And this is the the Nanorax, uh, the Nanorax render there. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't, the thing is this is very good to see, to see the low earth orbit economy actually starting to come to life. Um, but at the same time, it's not unexpected. We've seen a lot of commercial interest in space, space stations over the past few years. Um, like we've seen Axiom. Axiom, I think, is probably the best example at the current moment of a commercial space station coming to life. They're literally milling the metal to make, make modules to launch to the International Space Station. They're going to sort of bud and grow off the ISS and separate, sort of like some like some animal or organism. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's this is not unexpected, but it's also great to see because this is going to start making it easier and cheaper to get to space because the ISS is getting more, as it gets older, it's getting more and more expensive to repair. There's going to come a point and it's going to be a very sad day where the ISS gets too expensive to repair. Too much is, bre too much is breaking. It's, it's not worth it to keep repairing it. And they're going to need to move in some way to another space station. So it's good to start getting an idea of what's coming next after the ISS is done. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a very valid point. The ISS is not going to last forever. Um, and I think, isn't it the case when they're eventually going to deorbit the ISS, it's, it's a multi-year process to get all the pieces sort of separated and down? Because you don't want to do it all in one piece, right? Um, so if you want to be thinking about 
the future in terms of what the next space stations look like, you want to start doing it now. In fact, you probably want to start doing it a couple of years ago uh, in order to get the pieces in place so that we don't have a similar gap like we did with crew flight. Look, and Michael is circling a crew dragon and a Cygnus spacecraft, both attached to that station there. Uh, oh, sorry, that's a Northrop Grumman spacecraft. Oh, wait, this is a Northrop Grumman station. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Gotta say, I like that one. That, yeah, that, yeah, that one looks more like it. I mean, I've been impressed by the Orbital Reef where they've got several. Like, they've also got they've got like a gym, proper gym inside their space station. I thought, wow, that looks Skylab, like really good. Distinct yeah, Skylab. Skylab vibes on Orbital yeah. Reef. I like Skylab vibes. Yeah, but that too. looks more viable to me for some reason. It looks like a, a viable, functional station, which I think, is what they're, I, they're really looking for. Probably think, because it looks space stationy, for lack of a better word. Like it looks like what yeah. we think a space station looks like. You know, kind of looks like a tiny ISS. So, in your head, it probably it just looks right because that's what we're used to. Probably. I had <laughs> two. I had two thoughts when I first saw the space station. Um, first off, I think this one out of the three might be the most. I don't know what to call them, the most on time or the most realistic aspirationally yeah, yeah. because both of those modules there are Cygnus derived. Cygnus is sort of a space station module in itself. It's been designed like that from the start. They've even turned it into sort of a mini laboratory when it docks the ISS. They have laboratory equipment inside of Cygnus and it's just an extension of the station while it's there for about 90 days, which is a long stay for a visiting spacecraft. So to see them turning Cygnus into sort of a longer term habitat doesn't seem like as much of a stretch to me as making, say, clean sheet designs from um, Blue Origin or clean sheet designs from NanoRack. I think this one might have them hold the most water here. And also the second thought I had, that Cygnus there, unless this render is like really basic, there's no robotic arm, that Cygnus will have had to dock, which Cygnus cannot do right now. So that must be some sort of advanced Cygnus spacecraft right there. I like it. I like advanced Cygnus. Let's do some questions. Uh, Sam, Sam M asking, do we know what the Northrop station will look like? Uh, you're looking at it. <laughs> nice and convenient. Thank you for that one, Sam. Um, and don't forget, if you guys have questions, at NASA Space Flight in chat helps us see the question pop up uh, in some software that Michael wrote. Let's see. We did that one. Thank you, Sam. John is asking, instead of retiring the ISS and building a new station from scratch, wouldn't it be easier to just add new modules and deorbit the old? That's kind of like what you were talking about, Ian, right? Um, how they'll sort of grow off the ISS. But at a certain point, I mean, the ISS as a pressure vessel, there's leaks, it's getting old. There's a, like a, oh, what is it, the service tunnel? Oh my God, my brain. Um, it like has some issues that they need to figure out before they extend the mission much longer. It, the ISS has problems. It's an old thing. It's been up there for like, what, 20 plus years? So uh, yeah. it, it makes sense to use it while you can, but at a certain point, you're just gonna have to start from scratch. Is that, is that a fair estimate? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, the elements are old, and the the Amer it's actually interesting. The American segments of the station, most of them were scratch built for the space station, the International Space Station. But the Russian segment, um, at least the segment prior to Nauka's arrival, was Mir two. The Soviets were going to build Mir two, a second space station, kind of derived. But then when the Soviet Union collapsed, um, America approached the Russian Federation and said, "Hey, we have a space station project, Space Station Freedom. Would you like to add on to it?" and be like a propulsion for the station. And Russia said, yes. So the Russian segment is actually pretty old. And even though Nauka launched this year, it was built in the mid nineties. It was a structural spare for Zarya. So the space station is older than it seems. And it's, it, it's starting to show it. Yeah, that makes sense. Oh man, I, Mir, what a, what a crazy thing. You guys remember <laughs> Mir? <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's like oh no it, it's gonna crash again or it's completely out of control oh, i remember man. i remember the progress crashing into it michael yep. Furl being told by the russian cosmonaut co uh, commander get out get out how scary that must have been you hear a bang the station starts wobbling and you're told by your commander to get out get out that's not good <laughs> Yeah, that's that's a uh, that's like some nightmare fuel for sure. Like that that is the absolute number one thing you don't want to hear on orbit. Um, let's see. JTTV, this is one's going back a little bit, back to Crew Dragon. Any plans for a Russian to ride on Dragon? Has that been discussed? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're they're. I think they have a slot open on Crew Five for a Russian um, at the earliest. Uh, Russia has 
approved crew dragon at least for cosmonaut flight um and with that they can now start assigning cosmonauts to crew dragon missions it'll only be probably about one maybe two at most per flight um but yeah russians can now start flying on crew dragon as soon as crew five all right um let's see here's one from box is NASA really planning to build three different space stations? Are those commercial LEO destinations still going to be part of the international collaboration like the ISS? I don't think they're planning to build three separate stations. No. I think they're providing money to three separate companies to do the research so that those companies can then use that research to perhaps build stations of their own in a commercial capacity. Is that, is that a fair assessment? Yeah, it's, 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 less, it's just like commercial crew. It's just like when they were funding money towards Sierra, Sierra Nevada for Dream Chaser, Starliner, Boeing, SpaceX, and Dragon. Then they down select to the one they either want to take forward or two to want to take forward, but in this case, be one. Yeah, it's sort of similar to the, the human landing system uh, exactly, competition. Yeah. They, they awarded money to, what, three companies for the human landing system uh, yeah. development, and then they ended up down selecting to one with SpaceX. So they wanted to down select to two. They only got enough money from Congress for one, but Jeff I don't Jeff was Jeff was mad. Jeff was a mad yeah. boy. Um, <laughs> let's see. And Mr. Huggy says Bigelow has two space stations in orbit since 2006, 2008. I mean, I know they have Beam on the ISS. I don't know if I would count that as a space station. They had like Sundancer. They had they had some stuff that they've launched. Yeah, but the company has sort of shut its doors uh, since COVID kind of got them. They got Genesis. Well, the Genesis one, Genesis two. I don't know if they're still up there. Yeah, I think they, they might. Are. I think they are. Yeah. Yeah. Which is pretty wild. Um, but. Yeah, uh, hopefully that that technology does indeed live on with uh, with SNC. Um, let's see some super chats. Thomas with the SLS question: Why is SLS so much less capacity uh, to Leo than Ares Five? This is we need Philip for this one. <laughs> uh, anyone want to take a, a poke at that? I know it's like way off topic, but super chat. Uh, Ares 5 is what SLS really is, bar the fact that Ares 5 was RS-68, but they were going to change to SSMEs. So it really was, Ares 5 was going to become pretty much what SLS is now. I was more of a paper rocket than SLS because SLS is made, and if Ares yeah. 5 had gotten as far as SLS is, then it would have probably a similar rated capacity. See more about the uh, the question whether the the difference between the payload and the capability of the two because I can't imagine it being that much if anything and of course SLS is originally launched as a block one which is the um, DCSS which is from Delta four and then it'll go to the EUS which is exploration upper stage which is going to be four RL tens and that's where the capability comes back into block one B SLS is the one to really compare it with to be fair got it yeah. Um, Let's see a couple more super chats before we move on to the next uh, discussion topic, which will be Starlink. Uh, really quick, Mark says, "Great to see Jack's beard and Crispy on stream again. Keep it up." My beard says hi. Also, <laughs> also Crispy. <laughs> <laughs> Jacob says, uh, "Just stuff ISS parts into starships and bring back." That's hilarious. Thank you for the support there, Jacob. And James Juries says, "Off-topic question, but could spin launch be considered an SSTO? It's a spin stage to orbit. Mm -hmm. uh, is the SSTO it could be considered? I think. Okay. Mm -hmm. Come on, guys. Super chats are not off-topic question <laughs> playground land. It's a super chat. I'm just just giving you a hard time. <laughs> Let's see." Any questions on the orbital um, commercial space station stuff that we want to poke at before we move on? You guys see anything that tickles your fancy? Uh, nothing here from me. Cool, let's move on. Most of them, like... <laughs> <laughs> Next up, Starlink launched Group 4-3, or SpaceX launched Starlink Group 4-3. Those are words. Uh, mm. That was a launch out of Slick 40 the other night. You can see this footage here shot by Chris G, right? Yes, good tracking. Yeah, great launch. Uh, it launched, what was it, 48 Starlink satellites and two Black Sky Black ride Star. shares. Yep. Landed yeah. on short fall of Gravitas. Booster was 1060-9. Now 10. Mm -hmm. Now 10, because it That's landed. That's the fun thing. Yeah, because we thought it was a secret until one of the SpaceX's replied to one of uh, our guys, I can't remember it was, the one who tweeted said, it's actually the next one. Was it you, Jack? Were you no, I, I, think I, was, I think I was in on a tweet chain that involved that. 
Um, right. Okay. Yeah. But I don't think I was. Yeah. I don't think that, I was the genesis the of that information because I'm often, even if I have that information, <laughs> I'm too nervous to assert it because I don't like being wrong, and I'm often wrong, but I try to minimize the amount at, to which I am wrong. <laughs> yeah, the, the fun fact, a fun little segue there is that when, like this one was called, uh, what was it, 1069, when it lands, the second it lands on a drone ship, provided it don't blow up or I'll fall over, it becomes 10. Yep. Next one along. That's just something SpaceX do, so that's a fun fact. Sorry. Yeah, somebody on Twitter was trying to tell me that... Uh, that the booster for Dart had segmented as soon as it launched, and it and it was like no 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 it segmented no, no, when, no. It, when it lands. So yeah. technically, I tweeted while it was in the air before it landed. So I was technically correct, which, as we know, is the best kind of correct. <laughs> yes, it is. Yes. Um, but yeah, Starlink made it into orbit. Batch four dash two still question mark. But we've done four dash one and four dash three, and that's just in a absolutely astounding number of satellites in the starlink constellation already and despite the fact that there's thousands more to come mm -hmm. yeah and i i saw this launch in my backyard that was pretty cool um i don't live in florida i live in pennsylvania which is very far away from florida if you don't know the us um and the way that they fly starlink missions they fly hugging the east coast so they fly pretty much along the iss corridor and because of the time of day it was just after sunset here the second stage plume was lit up. It was a beautiful orange in the sky. It was unreal. And you, I saw it all the way up until stage cut off. It was tremendous. It was awesome. Wait, so did you get a little bit of jellyfish action? Or like the plume was illuminated? Is that what you said? Post jellyfish. So I got just the plume. Um, the plume was lit up orange, and then I just saw it shut down, and that was it. Very cool. Very uh, cool. That's always but, fun. By the way, the, the SpaceX drone Seagull did get away, apparently. Oh really? We, oh. Yeah, it was it was on the landing pad as the the camera skipped to the lighting effects of the landing burn, but you can see it fly away. I don't know if it would probably could still got impacted by the plume, but from all the from all accounts, it's a, it would survive because it got away fast enough. <laughs> Good. Yeah. You, if you guys didn't yeah, you see that, see you, can, you can see yeah. it right there. It's like somebody did a video where they, where they like captioned the bird and like they had little you know blurbs of whatever the bird was saying and. Oh, that was, a, that was <laughs> I had a good laugh. I had a very good laugh. Um, let's see. Garam or Graham, thank you so much for becoming a Capcom member. Thank you. Quick, quick aside. Thank you to our members so much. Thank you all of you for yeah. everything that you do to support the channel. And Graham or Graham, thank you so much for becoming a Capcom member. The thing about Capcom membership is you get access to the Discord. So oh, when, yes. that, when that populates, hop into Discord, say, hey, dare I say, <laughs> at me. And I'll come say hi, if in case I miss it. Um, but yeah, thank you so much to all of our members and to all of our new members. Let's see. We we're talking about this a second ago. Astro Hoff is asking, why no jellyfish on Thursday's launch? And how can I know better when to expect it in the future? I mean, I just think the timing of the launch and the position of the Earth and the Sun did not line up. Um, it, it requires a very specific timing. And I think Chris G has said this before. In Florida, it's normally the sort of thing we associate with a uh, pre-sunrise launch, right? And whereas on the West Coast, it's the thing we associate with a sunset launch. And that is just the nature of the position of the sun and the shadow and how it all works out. It can happen uh, for like as a sunset launch on the West Coast, and it can happen as a sun. Uh, or, it can happen at both times on either coast, but predominantly, it's it's you know. Uh, a sunrise thing on the, on the east coast so i'm not sure how that might have played into it there's a streak shot from steven that's a steven shot right i think so and i mean rocket streak shots they're they're just so cool i'm yeah. mm -hmm. i'm a big fan uh and steven never disappoints so great stuff from him there you can definitely uh if you want more from him i know he sells prints and whatnot you can check out steven on twitter he's a uh, space coast steve um let's see if i can spell that right it's like stve or something like you'll find it you'll find it if you follow nasa spaceflight if you follow chris b i mean he retweets everything so you bound to have seen it <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um let's see cool so we want to move on from starlink anything yeah. else i guess we could answer a couple questions really quick uh but there's a lot we don't know. Like Ross here is asking, what is the mass and, si and fairing size of each Starlink V2 satellite? I think all we know is that Elon has said Starlink V2 requires Starship because it's more massive and doesn't fit in Falcon 9's fairing. 
but I don't think we know much more beyond that. Like, if you want me to be like, oh, the mass is going to be approximately 47 kilograms over the mean weight of a Capistrano swallow. I don't know. Yeah, I, I got nothing. Uh, I'm not going to be able to that tell you that. That sounds legit. Well, I like that. We'll go with that, Jack. <laughs> cool. Uh, I'll take it. Let's see. Um, bum, bum, bum. Looking for a couple more Starlink questions. Maybe one more. Uh, and I don't see one. All right, moving on. Uh, let's see. Next up, Ariane Space launches Soyuz VS-26. Who wants to take that one? I'll quickly take a, a quick overview because this is quite fun that Ariane Space in French Guiana are launching this Russian Soyuz. And I go, what? It's a Soyuz STB. So it's quite a modernized version of the Soyuz rocket, but it's still the same Russ Soyuz. They still bring the engineers across from Ross Cosmos and their contractors into the control room at French Guiana. So it's all very much a Russian launch, but under kind of like a commercial deal with Ariane Space. Ariane Space have their Ariane 5 and Vega launches. They're going to go to Vega C and to Ariane 6 eventually. They'll still launch Soyuz rockets there. So it's just something where it's a different kind of capability. It gives them a bit more flexibility for their customers. And in this case, the customer is, as most of the time is, is the European Union. So the European Union want to launch their satellites on a Soyuz. It's a lot easier politically to say to get, we'll give them a Terry on space to go and buy the Soyuz rockets. So that's how it all works. It's kind of, kind of a fun thing politically wise, but this is a launch of two Galileo satellites. Uh, if you've seen someone on Twitter called uh, Euro, what's his name? Help me out, Ian or Jack. The uh, the person on Twitter who said they're my babies, he was quite hilarious in the preview to the launch where he's getting quite nervous. There Dutch. he is. There we go. Yeah, Dutch Space. If you follow him on Twitter, he's, he's great because he's there. He's with Galileo payloads, and they were going through several delays. Unbelievably, a weather delay for a Soyuz, which is unheard of. This thing <laughs> launching Sharknado. So yep. it's like, how bad was it that it couldn't launch a Soyuz in it? <laughs> but it was apparently it was upper level winds and things like that. So they can't. The difference between Balkano and French Guiana is there's populated areas where they could lose a rocket in ascent and then blow debris over the populated areas. You don't want that. And that's not allowed by the French services over there. So that's why it was delayed. But it launched last night without difficulty at all and successfully deployed two satellites after about four hours of flight off the frigate's upper stage. Nice. Look at that shot, too. That is probably yeah. one of my favorite phases of rocket flight when it's almost to first stage depletion and you get that insane plume that is just so expanded and you can see like the shock waves going through it. It's just a oh, beautiful shot there on that on that feed of the Soyuz launch. Cool. Um, let's move on to, well, let me see if we have any questions. Uh, Ghost Rider was asking, was it a Soyuz 2.1B? I don't know if that's a joke or if that's STB. a real question. They're, they're all very similar. There's, there's, there's STAs and STBs. There's 2.1s, 2.1Vs. They're just different configurations, but most of the time they're based on the same kind of rocket, just different kind of control systems. And obviously this one's got a frigate up stage. You've got Breeze M, which some go with, but that's mainly protons now. So it's just a standardized version of, of a Soyuz with different names. Cool. Very cool. Is, does decollage mean launch in French? Is that what that means? Yes. Uh, okay. Top is T0 as well. Very, very cool decollage. I just like saying that word. Decollage. It makes me, it makes me feel fancy. Uh, let's see. <laughs> cool. So let's move on to ULA is going to launch Atlas V on a mission called STP-3, which was going to go tonight slash this morning and is now delayed another 24 hours and you can mm. see michael drawing <laughs> commensurate so sad face there yeah this is well this one's michael art michael it's, it's, oh it's, it's rare it's more rare um so yeah let's talk about stp3 do we hear what the delay is i can't quite read that tweet i'm gonna get my face real close to the boom 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 repaired but addition require additional time to verify Sample integrity. Cool. So, yeah, STP-3 is an interesting mission. It is carrying two satellites for the Air Force, right? Uh, and it is going to be testing a variety of things, including nuclear detonation detection, laser communications. Um, it, it, it is using a new, new fairing, right? It's the same size fairing, but a different design or manufacturer. How does that work out? Yeah, so it is the same size. It looks pretty similar to a normal Atlas fairing. You wouldn't notice it if you 
didn't realize it. But what it is, it's the same kind of fairing that's going to fly on Vulcan, uh, the next United Launch Alliance rocket, which will be debuting next year, 2023, question mark. Um, but this fairing here has been redesigned. It's easier to manufacture, it's lighter, and it's cheaper, all of which are great to have, but it's still the same size. So it's a, a, a new formulation that's being built actually inside ULA's factory now in Alabama. So new fairing being debuted here. And originally, um, this mission, I think, was scheduled for last year. Um, and they had scheduled to fly new solid rocket boosters on this mission, but they had to push that back, or they had to um, push this mission back, and the new boosters have already, have already um, been flown before. So, Very cool. Let's see. Bum, bum, bum. Right, we said it was delayed. We talked about what it is going to do i mean with with launches like this where it's like it's a bunch of test payloads i always wonder what kind of stuff is on it that we are not really being told about i mean they tell us a variety of things they're testing but who knows what else they're testing gotta love the air force doing spooky stuff <laughs> space force uh i'm still not used to it <laughs> not uh. they could tell you but then <laughs> yeah right they don't have to launch you into space on stp4 <laughs> every time yeah. someone says space force me i think it's steve carell i can't help it <laughs> Just because yep. he's, he's, yeah, it's become, they've taken it over, but it's become a joke because it's only funny in the first place. But hey, look, it sounds good, Space Force. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, I wish I could have gotten into that show. I I gave it a real a real hard try, and I just I could not get into that show, unfortunately. I, it got better at the end. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. Did it, I mean, I feel like it would have benefited from being more like Silicon Valley, but like i feel like silicon valley really appropriately skewered the industry it was going after but i'm also not in that industry so maybe being sort of involved more in space flight i i liked it less than i would have if that makes any sense i'm like i'm too i'm too close uh let's see what we got here without oh, digressing it's like stargate universe where it started off horrendous me thinking why am i watching this but by the time it got really good they cancelled it <laughs> of course isn't that always how yeah. it goes yeah uh uh, and I can say, well, maybe a streaming service will pick it up, <laughs> but that's already, it was already on the stream. <laughs> Anyways, um, let's see. Zach is asking, why is STP launch STP three launching on Atlas five and not Falcon Heavy? Did we get any information as to why Atlas was selected for this launch in particular? Um, so I think what they like to do, they like to spread their launches out. They don't really like with the S so like with the STP missions, we've seen missions flown on Falcon nine, on Electron, on um. What's it called? Come on. Launcher one. Uh, yeah, Falcon Heavy as well. Uh, yeah, that was Falcon Heavy, not Falcon 9. Um, yeah, I think they like to spread the launches out as well. I'm not sure when this mission was assigned. It might have been before Falcon Heavy was certified. But yeah, this also this mission is also straight direct to geosynchronous. So they need a very powerful rocket. So we're getting into Falcon or sorry, Falcon Heavy and Atlas 5551 categories of lift class here. Very cool. Um, let's see. Uh, Javier is saying, do we have any graphics showing STP-3 flight path? My mom is in West Palm and wants to know if she'll be able to see it. West Palm's pretty close, right? Like, as long as it doesn't go completely north. It's going uh, probably completely east since it's going direct to Geo. Okay, I don't. we don't have a graphic. I don't know, but I'm going to guess that she'll be able to see it. Total guess. I know that's really useful. Uh, <laughs> But Flight Club is a really good resource for that kind of thing. Flight Club has like visibility. I forget if their visibility maps are um, are behind a paywall or not. But check out flightclub.io, and it will definitely help you answer your questions for varying amounts of money, potentially none. Let's see. Looking for some more questions. I think that's about it for STP three. I mean. Is there anything else we wanted to talk about for that mission? I mean, definitely stay tuned to the channel. If you don't subscribe, I don't know how you're watching this if you don't subscribe, but <laughs> make, yeah. make sure that you're subscribed because we will be going live for that launch. We will have a broadcast, and uh, and you'll be able to tune in and, and watch the team do its thing. It's always exciting to see an Atlas V 551 launch because that is quite the beast of a rocket. It's It flies off the pad. It's super loud. It's always fun time to watch i love watching those oh and uh 
Marto, one of our mods in chat, thank you so much, Marto, has posted a trajectory from Flight Club into chat. So check that out uh, if you're wondering what that trajectory is going to look like. Thank you. What, what, a, what a great mod team and what a great specific mod. Thank you, Marto. I'll be nice to the mods on this one then. I won't ask where everybody's watching from. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, I said it. Um, uh -oh. Okay, let's see. So, yeah, the launch of STP3 was delayed to today initially because of a GSE leak of RP1, and it's delayed to tomorrow for some additional checkouts. Uh, so, yeah, that's STP3 launching on Atlas. Now, what is it, Tuesday morning? Tuesday morning, Florida time? Is that, is that correct? Yes. Cool. All right, moving right along. I mean, geez, I don't know if anyone's really going to care too much about this last topic. It's... It's not really, you know, oh, very popular. Stars, yeah, oh, star, <laughs> geez. Let's, let's just call it here. It's yeah, not worth it. It's just in the feed. Um, no, Starship. <laughs> let's talk about Starship because there is a lot going on, including Elon tweeting that construction mm -hmm. of the Starship pad at 39A has commenced. Yay. Yeah, right. It's amazing, really, <laughs> because, I mean, this is the reason why I asked still at 39A. Even though it may to a lot of people think, well, Colossus at 39 now, you just have to Elon Cloud, aren't you? No, 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 no. The, the reason was because they freezed it for two years, the structure that they built at 39A. And we all thought, well, are they going to knock that down and rebuild it to what was Starbase's mount and system, tower system? Or will they go somewhere else, like maybe expand the area on landing pads down the cape, which would make some sense yep. as a kind of standalone test area before they then risked moving it to 39a but no he said 39a that's great and of course 39a is a rock star pad and I, that was me literally going yay in the second thing <laughs> but luckily luckily he replied that it was um he agreed that it's hollow ground it is uh we'll have similar but improved ground systems and tower to starbase now similar but improved so that where we've done a, I wrote an article today where we use Jade Shelters render, oh, which gosh. is basically just a render of the Starbase mount and tower yep. imposed into a 39A situation. But of course, the chances are, especially based on what Elon said there and what we can all assume is it's probably going to be a different kind of mount. So yep. <laughs> it's probably going to change again, especially when they're going to learn from the construction they've been doing at starbase so far they'll get some lessons learned and be able to modify the design i think that all plays into where they want to go with this they want to use starbase for mass production mass test launches mass launches that's what they'll do to shake out the system and by the time it does go to kennedy space center likely for the hls missions maybe even more but definitely for the hls missions they'll have enough flight experience to be confident that this vehicle not only launches fine without problem they can catch it as well so that makes perfect sense why they delayed their 39 information. There's still some questions to be answered, such as transportation of the stages. They're going to build it in Florida. They're going to use Roberts Road. They're going to use a barge turn, turn basin. They could. It's daft, but they could. Yep. But I think they may expand Roberts Road and use that as kind of an assembly, finishing off products, and maybe even use the BAB High Bay, the spare one that Omega was going to use yep. to do the assembly of the stages and then roll it out and use the chopsticks to stack it. I believe it. And it, yeah. it would make sense with the cadence that they want to hit with Starship and the fact that there's so many refueling missions required for certain profiles uh, that they have two launch sites. I mean, come on. I can see them yeah. launching something out of Texas and something out of Kennedy and having them link up, although I don't know if the inclinations that are possible allow that. Don't at me. Or do. Actually, I'm kind of curious. But... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it would make sense that they want more than one pad. So I'm not worried for for Starbase or for Boca Chica. I mean, I've, something about, I, I think it was an Ars Technica article from Eric Berger saying that SpaceX is reported to be spending around a billion dollars a year building up Starbase, which is, you know, that's not an investment they're just going to walk away from. No. Um, but definitely they're going to need more than one pad to, to do what they, they want to do, which is make humans multi-planetary. So it makes sense that that is coming back. And really quickly, let me just say, way to go. Uh, for Jay making this yeah. render. It's an absolutely yeah. beautiful render. And he often, you know, we'll get a little bit of news or something like this and he'll pop into Discord with a nice, beautiful render like this. So thanks to him for whipping that up so that we can sort of visualize what we're looking at here. Mm -hmm. One thing to note, the old, this is the this tower and mount is pictured in the place of 
the old beginnings of the structure that they were going to use. That structure has been removed. Um, yes. And so it remains to be seen if this will actually be where the tower and mount ends up or if it'll be somewhere else on the property or what that quite will look like. Somewhere else around 39A, maybe closer to the other tower or closer to the tank farm or who knows. But, uh, but that's what it looked like previously before they sort of dismantled it you can sort of see like that sort of scaffolding gantry looking structure there uh just behind the fence to the left of the tower um but no more that's gone and they have restarted on question mark question mark question mark which will be very interesting to see how that whole infrastructure grows up yeah it's it, this is exciting to see because yeah like you said they they were going full steam on cape canaveral starship they were doing Boca Chica and Cape Canaveral at the same time. Then when Starship Mark I popped in Boca Chica and they realized, whoa, this is a lot tougher than we thought it would be. And they moved everything to Boca Chica and just stopped. They just pretty much, you can see like in this picture or the old picture, there was like construction equipment and like just pieces of the, 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 the pieces of the new pad just laying right next to it, waiting for a crane to just install it, take a few hours of work and install it. They, they, they stopped. Yep. Um, but it's going to be interesting to see what they do now because the orbital pad if they copy what they did at boca chica and modify it with what they learned from that um th one thing that i thought of they're gonna need a place to static fire starships so could they do that at lz1 because they already static fire dragons there and i think there might have been like rumblings of doing a raptor test stand there way back in the day yeah. um yeah they were, they put like some starship hardware out there the, um, those rings there were literally section rings out there yeah. for no reason whatsoever <laughs> Yep, and there were some there were some mounts to hold the rings, yeah. like the the weird M mounts. But yeah, they can put a starship mount out there. Will it be similar to the suborbital sites at Boca? Could they put some Raptor test stands? Do some dynamic test stands, like how they do with the small test tanks, like the B two point ones and all that? What are they going to do out here? It's going to be pretty neat. Yeah, it's going to be super super neat, and we've got a bunch of really good questions about this coming in. Uh, here's one. Uh, what's the from Paul Kelly? What's the logic behind starting 39A before a second pad in Boca Chica, where they make the Starship? So we know that they are planning on having two launch site orbital launch sites in Boca Chica, the same way that they have two suborbital launch sites. Uh, and so, what is the logic behind building a third one or second one before they build a third one or whatever? Why is 39? And I think if I had to answer it, and you guys can chime in with what you think as well, obviously, I think it comes down to the orbital pad in Boca Chica is taking a lot of time and it also utilizes the launch site. They can't do testing or launching at the same time as they build the orbital pad. So I think it would be the case that as soon as they have an orbital pad that's ready to do launches, they're gonna do launches on it. And then yeah. instead of shutting down that process and building another orbital pad there, they'll get this one at 39A up and running. And then once they have those two, maybe they'll feel comfortable building the third one or or maybe the third one at, or, or sorry, the second one in Boca Chica will be built concurrent with the 39A pad. And we just haven't seen uh, workings of that yet, but uh, it makes sense to me that as soon as they get that orbital pad in, in Starbase running, they're gonna wanna start using it. I, I yeah. would add, that's exactly how I think as well, but I think that this first tower and first launch mount are very much ground proving tests where they can test everything they've been constructing and, and see how the rocket reacts on it, do fit checks to see how it reacts with that. Elon's hinted on Twitter that it's quite a challenge to launch mount. So I reckon they've probably learned a lot from the construction and testing with that tower and launch site that we see today. And that will be implemented on the second tower at Starbase and also the tower at KSC. So tower two and three may match compared to tower one. Yeah, I, I think that's fair because like like we saw, it took them a long time to build the orbital pad. Like they started it, they started doing foundation work, I think in early 2020, like very base foundation work. So right now, I think what they're probably doing is starting to do base foundation work, um, just like the very basic stuff while they finish up the pad in Boca Chica, then take the lessons to finish up the final above ground design because you're not going to be start. They're going to start building the tower in a few weeks. They're going to start building the tower many months down the road. They still have time to finalize the design and work in some improvements, even from the testing of booster four and ship 20, that's going to happen within the next month or two. So they're, they're going to be learning a lot over the next few months that they could put into this pad. So, and like you said, Jack, you need, if you want to do construction, you can't do launching. And if you want to do launching, you can't do constructing. 
At 39A, while it is for a Cape Canaveral pad, a relative, relatively high cadence launch site, there's still a few weeks between launches that you can do some concrete pouring, some assembling. But at Boca Chica, you're doing testing very often. So you need to kind of weave it together. And I, I think that's what they're trying to do. Yep, that makes perfect sense. Oh, wow. Here's a really generous super chat from John uh, Dopker. Thank you for the 50 bucks, buddy. They say, here's hoping we get to see tower lifts with Frankencrane again. I wonder oh. if they would use, I wonder how many LR1113 or 11350s there are. Like, and I wonder if they're all sort of hodgepodge parts. Like, are they all Frankencrane or is there only one? And then we get into a ship Athesia situation where it's like, what if you replace parts of Frankencrane with parts of other, other LR1350s? Is it still Frankencrane or is it becoming, a, okay, anyways, let's not get, let's not get. All, all I'll say, Jack, is I don't, <laughs> all I want to see is the chopsticks work. Yes. <laughs> so the, the less, the more challenges with cranes, the better as far as I'm concerned, because that will mean the chopsticks will have to do the job. When we start seeing those chopsticks lifting the booster stage onto the launch, well, I will lose my mind because I'll be like, wow, that's what it'll look like when they catch it as well. Because when that booster comes back and it's landing bird and it's caught in midair from the chopsticks and then lowered onto the mount, that's just sci-fi right there in front of our eyes. So I Absolutely. can't wait for chopstick action. Thank you so yeah. much for the generous support there. Uh, let's see what else we got. This is kind of following on what we're, what we're talking about with construction and launching and all of that. Dave Wolf is asking, thoughts on the insane amount of work that has gone into the orbital launch pad? I believe that one artifact has consumed more effort than anything else at Starbase. I mean, like Chris was just saying, that's a the, the mount itself, and that's not even to mention all of the other, like the ground support equipment, the tank farm, all of that. The mount itself is incredibly complex, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know... Stage zero can have infinite mass, but it also can take a seemingly infinite amount of time to construct. <laughs> but that is why they're going to start on 39A now. It's because when they need it, it'll be ready. Because if they wait to start on it, then you know it's just not <clears throat> it's not going to be in place uh, when it is time to use it. And I yeah. will say, I uh, probably shouldn't. I will say I heard a few months ago that they had already started work on the second tower. Um, like pieces for it, like fabricating pieces for the second tower. Oh, right. so, say, if, we'd see it from, we'd see it otherwise, won't we? Visually. Yeah, yeah, no, not not in Starbase. I mean, just like the parts required to build fabrication. It. Yeah, yeah, and it just goes into like what Ian was saying. Like they they start up the stuff many months ahead of when they actually mm -hmm. uh, when we actually start to see the dividends of them having started that stuff. Yep. Um, and I'm wondering now if second tower meant 39A. Yeah, that I don't know. That I don't know. That's a very good question. I, that's quite deep, Ian. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Because oh. I wish I had a piece of tinfoil. I would put it on my head. Uh, they haven't even started clearing land system. at Boca Chica for pad two. So. Yeah, that's true. That's very true. Let's see. Um, here's one from Ross, kind of a similar vein. Will construction of a Starship pad at 39A interfere with Falcon 9 launches? I mean, it can't. By nature, it can't. I mean, surely it will cause a sort of a logistics issue that they'll have to work through but by nature 39a is an operational pad and they can't be uh just shutting it down because it's the only place they can launch crew from right yep yeah. there's never going to be an, a, a con there's starship construction is never going to be prioritized over a launch unless it's a spacex internal launch or if there's a pressing matter they need to get done right now say if there's like a broken crane that they can't get away or something like that yep can i just just something that came to mind looking at this render imagine a time where Starship, a full stack Starship, is sat on that launch mile on 39A and SLS rolls out to 39B. It's going to be amazing. How do you politically say that the, the rocket on 39B is the future when you see that thing next mm -hmm. door on 39A? It's an incredible thing. I'm sure Elon started that. Didn't didn't they say that, uh, didn't Boeing say or NASA that they wanted to launch SLS into the 2050s? Like... Yeah, well, I don't know about the 2050s. They've done contracts for. Um, I think it's a three point something billion contract with Northrop Grumman for uh, SRBs through to Atomus 6 or something. <laughs> so they're very they're expensive. Just... So they're doing long lead items, but I don't think 2050s yet. I think I'd be amazed if SLS is still launched in 2050s. It'll I'd become be like the, in the B 52 of rockets. Please no. They just need to get a fixed price contract for the yeah, core state. Look, just SLS get, like, is a great rocket. By. SLS is good hardware. It's just yeah. not reusable. It's not viable. It's not got the launch cadence to make it viable. 
Otherwise, I love the rockets. I mean, it's my kind of rockets, shuttle derived technology. It's the engines I know, it's the boosts I know, it's the external tankage I know, which is now cost age. It's things I'm familiar with, so I'm naturally, you know, like it, but I can completely understand the problem with the launch cadence and the costs mm -hmm. and the, the way the contract's being done has been wrong. Yeah, they need and they, they need to get block one B because if you're just flying with block one, you have minimal capability. It, it, block one B is where you start to get into actual yes. use case. And block one yeah. B right now is a big question mark if it's ever going to happen. It's even gonna get made. Yeah, you're you right. keep pushing it back mission after mission. It, that's that's not yeah. good. Um, let's see, some more questions. Krango is asking, how will they transport ships and boosters? They can only be transported and kept upright, which I understand is correct. Uh, they're not meant to be transported horizontally. Uh, I think, you know, what a lot of us want to see is them to fly boosters, build them in Boca Chica, fly them to Kennedy. How realistic that would be given overflight of land in populated areas, I'm mm -hmm. uh, probably fairly unrealistic, but hey, Planes fly over populated areas all the time, and we're looking for airliner-like operations, dare I say. Das is going to yell at me in chat. Um, <laughs> <laughs> let's see. But yeah, the same thing. <laughs> that would make sense to me. Um, and so there's a lot of questions sort of in a similar vein, like, uh, uh, oh, I just lost it. Darn it. Oh, yeah, like Gus asking, do you know if they will build low, mid, and high bays at 39A, or they'll build them at Starbase and maybe fly them over? Yeah, we don't know, Gus. Um, but we were mentioning a second ago that Roberts Road facility, which it yeah. seems like that could be end up being a sort of Starship production east kind of situation. Yeah. You know, I'll know a bit now. Someone can can uh, remind me of when I said this, but I think they will use the expansion area, which they've already applied for at Roberts Road, to build a kind of like a mini Starship factory where they might even mm -hmm. get parts from Starbase and then assemble more in Roberts Road and they'll take it to the VAB high bay, the commercial high bay, which is there available, ready to use, and I'm sure yep. NASA would love SpaceX to take it, assemble yep. to boost it and ship stage and then roll out and stack on the pad. That's that what makes I think sense. they'll do. Yeah, that would absolutely make sense. I, that is literally my dream. So, yeah, I agree with what we said about Roberts Road. They've learned so much from Starbase, from Boca Chica. They can definitely build a more compact, a more permanent and a more productive facility in a smaller footprint which is exactly what roberts road is but using the vab to stack a super heavy booster first off the high bays are huge you can probably stack yeah. several ships and boosters inside of there at oh, same at yes. the same time probably about a half dozen easily and you can still roll more in but just seeing the doors open up and a super heavy <laughs> booster roll out I'll probably start crying. Yeah, and then um, SLS rolls out the other high bay and grows back in going, I don't like this. <laughs> it just, just like I'm intimidated. Back in. <laughs> yeah. Just like yeah. 60 miles an hour. I will just, my, my brain will break. Um, <sighs> but a lot of this reminds me of in the, in the environmental assessment document for Starbase, one of the things they mentioned was building that payload processing facility there, which would be a super tall structure designed to hold uh, boosters or ships, not stacked. But um, that's the the quote in that in that environmental assessment is that, that that's how tall it would be roughly. And if you think about it, the hangar, the HIF, the, the horizontal integration facility that we see in this shot, um, yeah. it can hold what uh, like five, four Falcon nines. Five. Oh, five, five. The, the Falcon Heavy didn't they? Right. right. Three, three cores, and then two separate cores. So, so yeah, five. Mm -hmm. So what I'm getting at is. They can store Falcon 9s in sort of these low warehousey type buildings. Once they have a lot of ships and boosters, they're going to need a very large cavernous building with which to store them all in. <laughs> that's my guess, yeah. anyways. Um, so that's also something, I guess, to look out for. Who knows if we, in this round of the space, the perimeter of Pod 39A is massive. Yep. The space there, if they wanted to do that at the actual launch site, that's the problem, you see, because that's why the production site and the build site, at, um, so the build site and the launch site at Starbase is two miles or whatever apart. It makes sense because you don't want your rocket crashing into the build site, <laughs> as may have happened with the earlier tests. So let, I'm, I'm completely guessing here now, but let's pretend they wanted that facility in Florida. Just mirror what they're doing at Starbase now with the larger high bay they're building. Mm -hmm. yep. That's perfect. That's yeah. all they need. Yep, that would make and sense. For the payload integration facility, I mean, Kennedy Space Center prides itself on being a multi-user spaceport. They would probably love nothing more than to build a super tall payload processing facility by the VAB. Or, yeah. I mean, even we've seen a lot of permits. There's a lot of interest in the shuttle landing facility, making that into an industrial yes. area. 
if you if they could talk to space florida or florida space or whatever it is space about florida. building a payload processing facility there where you could have like four bays to have starships or even just like the payload compartment that's detachable put that mm. there there's so much possibility for expansion to make starship facilities here this is going to be it, i think cape canaveral is going to turn into sort of a starship hub in itself absolutely really. yeah like yeah. i think it might even overshadow boca chica at some point i mean boca chica could end up being you know becoming a test and build site more than a, yep. you know a, a super active launch site although it's like i said in that ars article that eric Berger wrote a billion dollars a year that's that is no small investment so i don't expect starbase to go anywhere anytime soon but right now it is the current sort of focus of of the world of starship and that won't necessarily always be the case which brandon valvo asking the question uh what will be the extent of your coverage at 39a once it ramps up anything similar mm -hmm. to starbase daily videos i can't stress this enough i know i've said it before and i'll say it again we exist in a very specific very special moment in time and don't always expect things to be the way they are and the fact that we have this visibility into starbase thanks to mary you know who knows who knows what the future holds but 39a is obviously a much more difficult place to document as it's not just next to a public beach oh hey yeah you can hop up there uh <laughs> it's not just next to a public beach and uh, next to a, a public road that anybody can go and sort of uh and film things so we'll we'll just have to see what the future holds for that i want to, to answer to the question we are actively um, aware of the the um demand for that Yes. Let's just leave it yeah. at that. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Correct. Uh, we have a lot of super chat questions, and we have a lot of other questions, and we're we're running up on time constraints here. So let's jam through some other stuff, and then I will get to some of these super chat questions here. Uh, in Starbase, speaking of, in the last week or so, we have seen the nose cone jail. It's a nose cone test stand that was moved to. Please don't. Please don't eat my yogurt, cat. Uh, that was moved to uh, the scrapyard, which is interesting. I wonder if they're going to build a new rig for that or what have you. Um, we have also seen Ship 20's aft flaps tested. There was an aborted static fire attempt. Ooh, uh, Michael, I don't know if we have time to show that one, but that would be really cool to show. Uh, and at the same time, as that same testing window that they aborted this S-20 static fire attempt, they did B-2.1 testing, and that was the first use of the orbital tank farm, which is super cool. So a whole lot going on in Starbase. And if you haven't been keeping up with the daily videos that we were just talking about, make sure you, you, you give those a look because it's been an absolutely super active week. There's a new structure that we don't know what it's for assembled. First time that's ever happened, right? Um, but yeah, here's that, here's that, uh, that, testing from the other day when we had that static fire abort you can see starship getting uh fueled and and seemingly ready to go but no dice no joy as they say uh let's see booster five sort of peaked out of the high bay for a little bit not quite sure why more proof testing for booster 2.1 and here's the thing here's a fun thing that load spreader the load spreader that they use for the super heavy booster has been delivered to the launch site. I think that was yesterday. So yeah. look for booster four to get lifted back onto the orbital launch mount. And that means, you know what that means? We can uh, start to get excited for static fire testing of booster four, which, yep. oh man, am I excited for that. I think it can lift the booster onto the pad, but I don't know if it can lift a ship onto the booster. I think that's, I'm not sure what configurations are possible for that crane. So, uh, so yeah, chat is saying you are frozen, but I can yeah, see you just he, fine. He's frozen on a great picture there. See, yeah, that's kind of like framed him really well. <laughs> if well, that had been me, I'd have been like this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and then of course there was the whole email from Elon to the, there you go. There was a whole email from Elon to the workforce about uh, about uh, Raptor production potentially causing SpaceX to go bankrupt in a severe global recession. It might be possible, but the problem getting fixed. If you want more on that, maybe go watch the, uh, the um, that static fire abort stream, because we talked about yeah. it a bunch during that stream. Um, but suffice to say, don't necessarily think SpaceX is going to go bankrupt anytime soon, but it, you know, if you know Elon, this is sort of his classic management style of 
if you want to herd the cats, you don't politely ask the cats to do a thing. You yell at the cats and tell them, room is on fire, if they could understand you. Uh, because, you know, to motivate people, I guess he's found a way that works. So, let's see. I think that wraps it up for Starbase developments for the last week or so. I, I will just say that Whole lot people of have hundreds of questions about Starbase and stuff. I'm going to hopefully, when roadblocks are not allowed, because we need to, like, you know, obviously have the uh, uh, access to why we want to do this Raptor side chat with the enhanced camera. Um, we'll take lots of questions over an hour, just an hour Q and A on Starbase. So if you don't have the, um, you get the answer on these like live shows where we're limited on time, pop into Raptor side chat. It's available for everybody. We'll put it on Starbase live where we'll show we're going to have it. I'll come on mic and we'll take Q and A for an hour. Cool. Um, let's see whole lot of super chats coming in and some new memberships too thank you so much everybody aravel saying do you think any rocket will ever catch up with soyuz's total number of flights maybe starship or astra i think falcon 9 maybe but oh i don't well i don't know Soyuz has some absurd number of flights right yeah a star a starship if envisioned i mean it's, it's too early to say isn't it let's face it we can't guarantee this thing's going to work as well as elon wants it to do but if it does work as well as elon wants it to it's gonna be thousands of launches that's what uh, he said. Yeah. Uh, we'll go with that. Uh, let's see. Kevin L saying maybe Frankencrane, thank you for the support, uh, saying maybe Frankencrane is on its way to the Cape. What do you guys think? I think somebody mentioned that it was being used next to build a bridge. Bridge or something, yeah. In like Mississippi or something. I'm completely blanking on where, but it was it was relatively like, you know, well known that it's next contract anyways. Maybe not the next next one, but the current contract it's on right now after having been at SpaceX is building a bridge of some sort. Um, good question, though. Christian, Lily, thank you for the support. They say merch idea, NSF saddle, horse blankets, and dog collars. Oh, we, will tell the, we will tell the folks that run the store. Thank you for the suggestion. Speaking of merch. Hey. Hey, look at that. One for Jeff. Spaceport yeah. not found Spe for us. Speaking of merch. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyways, that's, hey. that's your merch plug. Um, buy our merch. It's almost Christmas. <laughs> Alex, Alex, oh, it's Alex. What's up, Alex? Um, saying, I would argue that, oh gosh, did I just hit the X? Oh no, I got rid of it. Oh no. <laughs> Michael, can we, can we make that super chat question come back? I completely just lost it. Um, in the meantime, Aravale, thank you so much for becoming a Capcom member. Like I mentioned earlier, Capcom members, you get Discord access. So hop into yep. Discord, at me if you want. This is the one time I'll say you can do that on Discord. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll say, hey, I'll respond with my uh, compulsory Forrest Gump gif. Here Very we go. active, but civil Discord. Um, there is <laughs> civil Discord. Hey, that's what they call it. There. It's 1,100 members now, so it's quite a busy place, but it is member only, so it means you avoid getting a lot of numpties in there because they're all the same-minded folk. Yeah, a lot of good info in there and a lot of good discourse and just some fun, too. A whole bunch of cursed rockets, which is... Honestly, <laughs> yeah. if you're into it, I'm into it. Uh, it's a lot of fun. Uh, Alex, what's up, dude? saying, I would argue that the conditions at 39A are better because Falcon is not a pad queen like Starship, who usually tests for days at a time like at Starbase. So this is going back to talking about construction of the Starship pad at 39A holding up Falcon 9 launches, which is very true. Falcon 9 scrubs very rarely. I would definitely agree that it is not a pad queen, which if you're not familiar with that terminology, a lot of times in aerospace, like an aircraft, that sits in the hangar a lot because it breaks down a lot. They call it a hangar queen. So, uh, uh, you know, I agree. It's a it's astute analysis as usual from Alejandro. Uh, Dave Wolf asking, do we ever think we'll see a high a wide bay at the Cape? We were talking about that earlier. I think it's completely yeah. plausible. Yeah. Super good question from Dave, and thank you for the support there, buddy. A couple more super chats. Jr. asking, would Starship launches at the Cape bypass FAA regulations? <laughs> yeah, are we all showing our plushies now? Or yeah. is it just, this is just devolved into nerd hour. Uh, I just I just quickly saw a super chat come in, so I thought I'd just to carry on, sorry. Uh, it wouldn't bypass <laughs> FAA regulations. It's a separate set of assessments to, uh, to what happens in Starbase. So there is still an environmental assessment, and you can see this one was from September 19th, 2019. 2019 and it's already done so it is uh, a whole different deal so it's not bypassing faa regulations but it is not related to the environmental assessment currently being finished hopefully in starbase it's a separate one that occurred and is done and we're good so nothing to worry about there um will blue origin ever build a 
new Armstrong rocket from Simcha. Yes, they're building it right now. We just saw a Pathfinder rolled out recently. Thank you for no. the support. No, did he say new? Did he say new Glenn, new Armstrong? Oh, he said new Armstrong. Right, we saw. Ah, new you see, Pathfinder. that's the trick there. It catches me out a lot. New Glenn, they're doing the Pathfinder for, but new Armstrong is the one that they have not showed any details about. But we know it's kind of existing in the mindset of Jeff Bezos. Mm -hmm. So whether that happened or not is interesting because new Armstrong is supposed to be a super class heavy lift launch vehicle. Yep. I'm wondering if it'll be a Blue Origin Starship competitor in some mm -hmm. way. Maybe it'll be an evolution, a new Glenn. Maybe it'll be a clean sheet design. Maybe it'll be like a 12 meter rocket. I remember hearing ramblings. My first article for NSF actually was talking Good. about how they were looking for Slick 49, a brand new launch pad to launch new Armstrong. Um, and I see we have a special guest on the stream. <laughs> Just ignore it. Just ignore it. <laughs> but yeah, so they were at some point looking for a new pad, which suggests it might be a brand new rocket. But again, that was almost four years ago. So a lot could have happened in then. Very cool. Um, Dougal, what's up, Dougal? Always seeing your name in chat and with the support, always say, got my Starship plushie. Thanks, y'all. Are we sold out of the Starship plushies now? No, we've got 100 left, I think. we got 100 Starship plushies left. I'm just, just saying, if you want to say the least. <laughs> get it now. We may or may not restock what? them in the future, but the current batch. Perks. Is... perks. <laughs> yep. Very cool. They're pretty nice. They are bigger, bigger than I thought they were, because we're going to the picture yeah. power to get it. Gauge yeah. it no, they're bigger. It's a it's a really big starship and it's a really good dog toy I must say. Mhm. Mm it is. Um, let's see. And here's here's a super chat question. It's I don't know how much time we have for this cuz this is a this is a question I'm sure we could talk for like 30 minutes or an hour on. Uh Mason, ask this next time we're doing a stream where we're watching a tank for like 3 hours and we need something to talk about. Um can you each speculate on what the Starship program will look like over the next 10 years? Love you guys. Keep up the awesome work. Well, thank you so much for that generous support. I'll just quickly say, and again, ask this again when we can wax philosophically about it for a while, because um, we are running up on some time constraints here. But I will say that if you look at 10 years ago, just look at 10 years ago, and it doesn't even have to necessarily be a rocket, but look at technology 10 years ago versus technology today. Um, the, the leaps and bounds that we will have jumped and the evolution that Starship will go from what we know today to what it will be in 10 years is, I mean, it might not even be recognizable. It might just be a completely different setup. I mean, 10 years in this, especially at the speed SpaceX goes, is a long time. So I don't know if either of you wants to throw in a quick thought on this. And we should, maybe we should save this or something and revisit it next time we're, we're short on questions on a stream. But this is, this is something I would really like to, uh, to talk more about. But again, yeah. we're kind of getting short on time here. Yeah, it's, I, I, it's a, yeah, I'll quickly say I agree with that. It's the longest discussion. It's about a 10-minute discussion at least because there's several caveats to how that could you know proceed forward. And that, that will play into it. We'll get, it will be several paths it could go fork along along the path to what we're eventually it'll, eventually it'll eventually become. So it's a tough one to answer in a very short period of time. Yeah, yep. and I, I agree. It's a difficult question. There's a lot that we've seen a lot happen in the past two years. Starship has gone from having three fins to two. It's gone from having seven Raptor engines to six. It's There's been a lot of changes, even just between single prototypes, but there's been a lot of changes. It would be tough to say what Starship looks like in three years, let alone 10 years. In 10 years, we could see 12 meter diameter Starship. We could see mm. 18, probably not 18 meter, but we could, I, I can't even begin to imagine what we can see. And it's it's going to be a lot of fun to watch it all unfold. And that's, one of the reasons that I love all the content that we put out, it's because you, you just get to see something you don't normally get to see. And I, I don't know, end of my speech. I, I really <laughs> just say super, super heavy. You're right. Yeah. Super duper triple, heavy. Triple core. Yes, Jack, exactly. <laughs> they better call it super duper heavy or I'm going to stop. Yeah. Triple core, 18 meter, just all the things everybody wants. Triple core, 18 engines. meter. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're launching the earth away from Starship. <laughs> It's how we're going to solve global warming. We're just going to move the Earth with an inverted super duper heavy. Anyways, I, I'll stop. Um, but Mason, I will say, uh, look at what happened with Falcon 9, right? They changed the engine layout. They stretched the tanks. They improved the engine. They improved the propellant uh, handling in terms of being able to subcool the propellant. Um, and they iterated on Falcon 9, and they'll do the same with Starship. And over the course mm -hmm. of the next 10 years, the vehicle will just get more robust and more capable and more reliable. And we'll, you know, we'll see how that goes. But super good question. I think that about...
does it. Does anyone have any questions that they want to address before we roll out of here? No, I'll just stress again, because I, I go in, in streams where sometimes you ask a question and you don't get answered. Trust me, we, we try and answer as many as we can. And if you have questions that are burning, you really want to answer to Starbase Live. We're 24 seven and I'm always in there as much as I possibly can be. So pop on Starbase Live, ask your question. I guarantee you either I, a moderator or someone knowledgeable because they're quite knowledgeable people in that chat community will answer the question for you. So that's the best route to take. Yeah, Starbase Live chat is almost like Discord light. Like our, it's almost mm. like our, a light version of our Discord because there's only the one channel. But basically, a lot of the people that are in the Discord are also in the Starbase Live chat. And so you can go in there and, and hang out and chat. And speaking of our Discord, thank you once again to all of our members. We had a couple new Capcom members come in uh, during the stream. So thank you so much. Thank you to our launch directors and our flight engineers. I repeatedly joke. I know it might you might be rolling your eyes because I make the same joke every time, but we, we need to like have somebody read all of these names and then condense it into like a third of a second, like high frequency burst, like a data burst. <laughs> um, there's just too many names at this point to read to read them all out. But that is a really good problem to have. And because we have that really good problem, we're able to keep doing what we do and even expand expanding what we do, which we've got some stuff in the works that we're really excited about. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much to everyone that watches, everyone that hits the like button, everyone that subscribes, but especially thank you to the people who do the super chats and people who are members because you keep the lights on, you keep the data flowing, and you keep the robots happy and fed. So thank you, <laughs> and that includes us. So thank you so much, everybody. I think that's it for this week. That's about it. Am I forgetting anything? I feel like no, I'm forgetting something. Oh, all right, Cat says bye. <laughs> You're not gonna introduce it. What's its name? Uh, its name is Thelma, and we're fostering it. Anyone oh. want a cat? Oh, all right. I th oh, that's it. That's it. But, but you're still here. It's over. <laughs> Ferris Bueller reference. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Am I forgetting something? Okay, no, we're ending. <laughs> <laughs>